Okay, so this is FFRF's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. And thank you for watching. And uh, the song we heard before the show started was about miracles. It almost feels like a miracle, doesn't it? We can sit here in FFRF's office and just be on live TV in front of this massive audience of free thinkers. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And it's that time of year again, and we're going to be talking about football. And uh, in the studio with me are two very busy FFRF attorneys, Patrick Elliott. You've been with us for, what, eight? Eight and a half years. Eight and a half years, yeah. one of our senior attorneys. Uh, and Chris Lyon is a younger but just as important <laughs> attorney, uh, the Patrick O'Reilly Legal Fellow. And you guys have been really... Uh, busy working on school complaints and state church and football. If, if you have a question, if you want to ask us a question, I have this little, little uh, iPad here, and uh, Lauren then will transfer your question. You can just enter it right into Facebook, or you can send an email to free thought, no, ask an atheist. That's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a different show. We have so many email addresses. You can send an uh, email to askanatheist at ffrf.org, and it'll get by miracle, it'll just come to this little tablet, and I'll read it, and we'll respond to your questions. So, um, Patrick and Chris, you have been busy with school complaints, obviously, this year. But we're talking about football, and especially football in the South. What are some of the issues that are coming up here? Well, we've already been dealing with issues all over the country. We had major issues spring up in Ohio, West Virginia, Alabama, and Georgia already this year. Uh, they seem to revolve around two main issue areas. You have loudspeaker prayer, which is prayer over the loudspeaker before the game begins. And then you have coaches or chaplains leading teams in prayer before or after games, uh, in the locker room before games, things like that. That seems to be the two main issues that these football prayer um, prayers fall into. So how do you find out about this? Do you, do you and Patrick drive around Georgia and Tennessee looking for these things or what? How, how do you know about this? So we get complaints from all over the country. People write into us letting us know that these are going on. Um, a lot of these are recorded. Someone will record it on their phone when the loudspeaker prayer is going on or uh, chaplains will promote their preaching online. They, they want to show that they're preaching to the team. And so it'll be put up on Facebook. Someone will send that in to us. And then we can write to the school districts and let them know that they, these are constitutional violations that they're showing um, <laughs> to the world. So are they really violations, Patrick? Is it wrong what they're doing? Right. Well, you know, we, we deal with public school issues um, across the board. But football, this time of year, is a special time for school athletics, football-related issues. Um, and why we can say it's not just the Freedom From Religion Foundation saying that these are constitutional violations. Um, the Supreme Court has actually ruled on on football prayer case. So in in 2000, um, a case um, called um, Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe, uh, there were broadcast prayers prior to football games, and you know some of the typical tried and true arguments come up in that context, saying um, you know the school district defending it, saying oh well nobody's compelled to be at a you know a school football game, or um, well this is just you know um, a voluntary exercise, and so. Um, there, the Supreme Court, um, I believe six justices ruled that the prayers over the, you know, broadcast by the school, over the loudspeaker, on school property, uh, pursuant to a school policy that allowed for, you know, prayer to take place, um, were unconstitutional. And so, you know, that's the same with, with uh, school football prayer or a prior Supreme Court case um, in the 1990s regarding school graduations, so graduations at school events. Um, it's not that big of a jump to go from, you know, a school graduation prayer being unconstitutional to, you know, moving to a uh, school uh, athletic event. Because these are official school events. It's not really the student's free speech involved here, right? It's, 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 it's considered government speech, isn't it, when it's at an official event over the loudspeakers during that time? Right. You know, when the courts look at this, they often will look to, you know, what, what would somebody observe? And so when you're at a, a, a football game and there's a a public address announcer announcing a game announcements for the games, you take that to be the message from your school, which controls that microphone and controls what is said. So yeah, really, it is, it is a message from the school when that's being broadcast to every, everyone. Um, Chris also mentioned the other, I guess, violation that comes up in this context is actually, um, to some extent, more um, harmful to the individual players is when the coaches, um, you know, that's a complaint that we get where the coaches themselves are 
pushing prayer, um, promoting prayer uh, upon students. Um, and I know Chris dealt with this recently in a Georgia school system. Yep, one place where football and, and religion, you know, where people are particularly fervent about both those things is Georgia. We recently had a complaint about a uh, character coach for the team who was praying in the locker room before the games with the team and in fact brought in younger players even to do it. Uh, there was a video of this and we complained to uh, the Dawson County School District about this. We actually have a news clip that But this uh, wasn't the coach, it was a character coach, Yeah, right? this was a pastor who was brought in to pray uh. with the team and we do have a news clip uh, that, oh, okay. that talks about this. Praying is a devotional act with strong religious ties. Now a national nonprofit organization is hoping that the Dawson County School District stops a pregame tradition after a video of a pregame prayer was posted on Facebook. Lord, we thank you. God, for another day, we thank you. This video of a pregame prayer posted on September 7th from inside the Dawson County High School locker room has garnered nearly 900 shares and 68,000 views. Under it, Comments like, chills, absolutely love this, and that is awesome. God, they're a big brother, they're a hero. However, this video made its way in front of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Chris Lined with the organization, which focuses its efforts on separating church and state, says they received a complaint after the video surfaced. We were contacted by a concerned area resident who let us know that the Dawson County High School has been employing a religious character coach to pray with its football team. The nonprofit says the man in the video is Pastor Russell Davis, listed as a volunteer on the school's website, and lists himself as a chaplain and character coach for the team on Twitter. In a letter sent last week, Freedom From Religion asked the Dawson County School District to ensure that its football program is no longer allowing religious leaders to have access to its students or promoting religion and to investigate the matter. A public schools cannot appoint or employ a chaplain or seek out a spiritual leader for students. Any person who doesn't subscribe to the religious views of this character coach is not going to, you know, stand up and, and be separate from the team. They're going to just feel coerced. Back in October of last year, the organization sent a similar letter to the Coweta school system after East Coweta high head football coach John Small was pictured praying with players, resulted in the school system restricting faculty and coaches from leading students in prayer. In a statement from the Dawson County School Superintendent, Dr. Damon Gibbs, he says the district was made aware of the letter Friday and goes on to say that the district is committed to following the parameters set forth in the First Amendment. So they were saying the Lord's Prayer in that video, weren't they? Our Father which art in heaven. They did, they did everything in that video. The pastor did a devotional, went through a whole multi-minute long religious spiel talking about like how they weren't going to be bearing the cross the way Jesus was and all this weird stuff. He then did a more traditional prayer um, that we'd expect about Lord and um, God this and Lord that, and then led them in the Lord's Prayer. So he did the whole, this was a, a very... Um, religious moment. Well, very, very Christian, because the Lord's Prayer out of Matthew is specifically pr Jesus telling people how to pray. And it looked like every single kid there was like praying the Lord's Prayer with their heads bowed. Like, and, 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 and this pastor wasn't just talking. He was not like yelling at them. Okay. Yeah, he was fiery. And in the clip, they, they noted that, he, that he's listed as a volunteer on the school's website. That wasn't true at the time we wrote. When I wrote the letter, he was listed as character coach, pastor at Etowah Church, and upon receiving the letter, they've changed it to volunteer um, in order to kind of cover their tracks. But even uh, then, what authority does he have? The coach brings in this guy, and all the students have to... Yeah, know. as far as I know, I, I don't know that he's a, a real coach. I think the whole reason they probably brought him in, he's a pastor from a church, was to lead these prayers with the team. I'm not sure why they're keeping him around and not just letting him go after this. Uh, we haven't received a response from the district itself, but in the media, they've been telling everyone that the prayers are going to stop and that o prayers will only be student-led from now on. Uh, and I think when you watch that clip, you know, you pick up on what the harm is. You know, it's not really truly voluntary when, you know, the whole team is gathered. If you have a, uh, you know, a, a son that wants to participate in the sport and the coach is, you know, saying, um, you know, picks the pastor and, and certainly saying things that the coaches agree with, um, it's pretty coercive, I think, that kind of environment to to push that on somebody else. And this is where I always think it's interesting, you know, where um, from the atheist perspective, 
I can't imagine an atheist, you know, getting every a whole group of you know student athletes together and then telling them all how there's not a God. You know, that doesn't mm -hmm. happen. Um, it's not a thing that people are actually doing. But the reverse is happening, where people have their religious beliefs and are really putting it on other people's children, and that does go, you know, to what the establishment clause is about. And I think it is a serious violation when kids are getting pressured into participating in something well, like on, that. Well, on this video, can you imagine one of those 14-year-olds going, uh, <laughs> yeah. I object uh, on constitutional grounds, my rights are, I mean, in the middle of that whole team spirit and rah, rah, we're going to win this game together. And right. So who would dare do that? Uh. Right. And, you know, this is the, I guess, another theme from this that comes to mind is the, um, I guess you call it creativity uh, with how schools, not just public schools, but we've seen this from public universities, um, when FFRF has looked into religious programming within the football program, they'll come up with a creative name, a uh, character coach or player development coach. Um, really, they want to put on staff a, st uh, a, a chaplain or a pastor to get people to be Christian and to, to maintain their religiosity. And so, um, I'm always amused by the different titles that come up, but it's a thing that we've been seeing for years is that there's always some means of giving them a title or, or even volunteer coach in this instance. If he's not actually coaching them to play the game of football, he probably shouldn't be in the locker room at all. Or on the sideline or right. involved with the team. Why are you just letting some person who has no reason to be there be hanging around the team? It just right. There's no good reason for okay, it. Okay, but if a couple of the students wanted to get in the corner of the locker room and just pray themselves, just... Or some people in the stands wanted to just hold hands and pray. We would not object to that. Nope. And in fact, they don't even have to hide in the corner of the locker room. They can. Uh, I think what happened actually at this school is that next Friday, the team went by itself and prayed with no adults present. And the team can do that. Student prayer is protected under our Constitution. The team or players of the team? Players from the team. I, yeah. I don't know. You know, I, yeah. I feel like a lot of them might have been pressured. I mean, you know, those who yeah. may not have actually wanted to be part of it may have felt pressure, but at least in this case, there were no longer adults leading the team in prayer this last Friday. So um, we wouldn't complain about that. That's, that's freedom of religion, right? Exactly. So. What, I mean, what's also interesting about why I, mean, why I guess this Ask an Atheist is about uh, football is from what I've seen, again, working here for the last eight, eight and a half years, um, it's a very big football problem. We're not, we're, I mean, occasionally we'll get complaints about um, a basketball coach or a track coach or a volleyball coach, but this is a football problem, both both from the coaches that are there and then from the actual events themselves when they're broadcasting the prayers. And there's no real good reason for that other than it seems to be passed down from um, traditions on what certain schools are doing. But you can, I, I rarely see other, other sports um, engaging in this type of, of behavior. I think it's a guilty conscience because <laughs> the Bible says you should not touch the carcass of a dead animal. But a football <laughs> is a pigskin, right? And here they are violating their own scripture. They got to pray for forgiveness from that. You might be on something. I'm sure that's exactly what they're thinking. Yeah. Well, and as we bring up all the time, the Bible also says not to pray, be like a hypocrite and pray publicly like you would over the loudspeaker, that you're supposed to pray, you know, in the closet or to yourself, you know, that's uh, a recommendation in Matthew. That, so how could you know, a character right? coach pull this off? Could they do it in a secular way? Rah, rah, team spirit kind of thing? Right. Well, I think I see, I've never seen, at least in a public school setting, a, a character coach as a part of a, a football program in a legal manner. It's really a, a, just a pseudonym for a pastor. Uh -huh. um, certainly, um, people can have a positive influence on, on students' lives um, outside of purely coaching them in football in that way. But uh, certainly this, you know, a, a person who happens to be a religious person can engage in sports or in, in coaching. Um, so, yeah, they could say rah, rah, but yeah. they obviously can't be collectively getting them to, you know, engage in prayer or uh, preaching sessions, which is what's going on here. But why do you even need that, though? I mean, I, I've had coaches in my life, you know, when I was younger, um, coaches, our character coaches. You yeah. know, that's part of what coaches do. They don't just yeah. teach you how to play the game, tell you where to go and everything. They try to instill character in you. There's no need to bring in someone special to teach character, I don't think. And, you know, that's the reason why, as we know, it's just coded language to bring in a religious uh, instructor. Mm -hmm. But I think there's no real need for a special character coach. Anyway, coaches, you know, most of these teams have five or six coaches. 
those coaches can teach character, real secular character, not as a euphemism for uh, biblical and Christian. So what teaching. else do we have here? We're going to go to loudspeaker prayers, or you yeah, we can talk about loudspeaker prayers. Um, uh, we this is another issue we deal with. We've won it all over the country, but in particular, right now, schools in Alabama have finally listened to us and are stopping prayer over the loudspeaker. Uh, one of those uh, school districts is Blount County Schools. We actually have a news clip on this one to kind of introduce it to us. Well, new tonight, some people are upset after learning that Blunt County Schools will no longer allow prayer over the loudspeaker before football games. Starting this week, there will be a moment of silence in place of the pregame prayer. CBS 42 News reporter Michael Clark joins us live in studio now after talking with neighbors there in Blunt County. Michael. Yeah, for as long as many of those neighbors in Blunt County can remember, a student or volunteer has led a prayer over the public address system before football games. That all ends Friday after a complaint from an outside organization. Under Friday night lights at Blunt County Schools, any pregame prayers will now have to be unplugged. One of our youth actually led the prayer over the PA system. And that was last week. And that was last week. Scott Wortham is a youth minister at Remlap's First Baptist Church just down the road from Southeastern High School. We really see no harm in praying for the welfare of our football players and those that will be playing and protection and good sportsmanship. But the Blunt County School Superintendent says an organization outside the community recently filed a complaint about prayer over the intercom and on guidance from attorneys there will instead be a moment of silence. We believe that uh, prayer should be in school and when there's not then obviously the country doesn't have blessing. Religion is ingrained in many who live here. On a Wednesday night, we found members of the Church of Remlap cleaning windshields as a part of their ministry. I feel like we as Christians are being silenced, um, and so we have to go with the majority that's very loud. Organizations previously threatened other area schools with lawsuits, arguing that not everyone should be subjected to a prayer over a public intercom. A complaint prompted Hewitt Trustville students to say their own prayer during a moment of silence last year. Some neighbors say even without an intercom, they'll still pronounce their faith. We believe that that's an integral part of our life. We believe that to be able to pray, that uh, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Now, there were a few people who reached out to me in uh, social media context who live in Blount County that said they don't really feel like religion should be forced on everyone, but they don't want to speak out against the majority. There will be four Blount County home games this Friday. That's funny. The Christians are complaining about this majority that's trying to suppress them, and yet they are the majority, as he just said at the end of this. Right. They clearly are. Yeah, she refers to the Christians in this community who want prayer over the loudspeaker as the minority, and we're the loud majority. But as he pointed out, the uh, non-religious in the community who, who reached out to him anonymously because they're afraid of this Christian majority are the real minority in this case who are, who are being forced to have loudspeaker prayer. And now there's just going to be a moment of silence. And so those who want to pray can pray. Those who don't want prayer forced on them don't have to have that. And it, it seems to me like this is a great solution. I'm not sure why they're so but uh, upset. Uh, isn't a moment si moment of silence has also been tested constitutionally, if its intention is to allow for prayer, um, the the Jaffrey case, right. right? Yeah, there's a there's a Supreme Court case, Wallace versus Jaffrey, that really dealt with this, where the schools uh, school system basically implementing moment of silence as a time for prayer being ruled unconstitutional. Um, since that time, there have been some other courts, um, not the Supreme Court, which is obviously, you know, the highest court in the land, that have found other moment of silence um, type state laws to be permissible. So it is a bit of a gray area. Um, we obviously think they should, you know, play football and, and have a ceremony and get down to business. There's no need for a moment of silence prior to uh, a, a sporting event. Well, to solemnize the event. I mean, a moment of silence is nothing. It's just a right. moment of silence. Right. But I think the Wallace v. Jaffrey case showed that if it was the intention of the legislature to use that moment of silence, and they found some smoking gun language, I think, then that's unconstitutional. But if a school district implements a moment of silence with nothing, then how can you challenge that, right? But also notice that that's not even good enough for them in this case. You know, yeah. that's, this is the thing they're outraged about, that now, rather than having prayer broadcasts over the loudspeaker, the school's offering them an opportunity to pray on their own. And there's, you know, as you said, that could be taken as, the moment of silence could be taken as encouraging prayer. Well, here the school is still saying, 
take a moment to yourself and pray. And they're saying, this isn't good enough. We need sure. to be, it needs to be over the loudspeaker for everyone to hear. Otherwise, our rights are being violated, which is, of course, ridiculous. And then they complain about us being an outside group. They always say that, don't it? Don't, first of all, right. wasn't there local complainants? Yep, we receive uh, local complaints and all of these issues. Someone from the community, like those people who reached out to that anchor, who don't feel comfortable voicing their concerns themselves because of the, this sort of backlash and fervor that we see uh, when even just suggesting that Christians don't get to pray for everyone over the loudspeaker uh, is taken away, they, that there's outrage in the community. Yeah, and isn't the... Supreme Court, an outside group to them. I mean, it's the federal law that should apply all over the country. So it doesn't matter if it's an outside group or what. It's the law that should matter. Right. Yep, yeah, we're not just coming up with this idea. We're telling them about Supreme Court rulings that already exist and telling them that they need to follow the Supreme Court rulings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Santa Fe case was you know, 18 years ago now, and now finally school districts are listening and stopping loudspeaker prayer. Um, this is one school district in Alabama, but a lot of school districts across Alabama are stopping. One reason for that, we've learned, is that a, um, an attorney for the Association of Alabama School Boards has been going around and telling those school districts the same thing we've been telling them for years, that praying over the loudspeaker is unconstitutional under Santa Fe. Uh, in fact, she pointed out to them that this, that they're playing with house money is how she refers to it, but they're basically taxpayers are going to lose money if you guys violate people's rights and get sued over it um, in this yeah. way. So our group is kind of enforcing the law. We're not making the law. We're like, um, what, the Highway Patrol or something? Right, some, right, right. I mean, who in the government, that, you know, there's these Supreme Court decisions. Well, who's enforcing them? So it's groups like ours and it's individual plaintiffs who have to come forward and say, look, here's the law. Well, that first news clip we showed earlier said that we're a group that tries to separate state and church. <laughs> but the truth is we're a group that protects that separation. The separation exists. It was put into our Constitution. It was decided by our founding fathers. Our group is protecting that separation. We're not trying to create something that wasn't already there. So this was Alabama, right? Did, didn't Roy Moore have something to do with... Uh... <laughs> Didn't yep. Uh, in response to this, to like I said, all the school districts now have started following the law, and Roy Moyers and his group, the Foundation for Moral Law, are very upset about this. They held a press, press conference about a week ago, um, and we have a clip introducing... Does everybody what, know who Roy Moore is, basically? The, well, I mean, he's... I, I think you can say safely that he's the only, you know, state Supreme Court justice that's ever been removed twice from office. Um, you know, first for unconstitutionally putting up the Ten Commandments, and failing to abide by federal court order, and then more recently, failing to abide by Supreme Court decisions on gay marriage. And so he's been removed twice from office. Basically, he's a, you know, a disgraced former Supreme Court justice, failed politician. and in, in Because he ran for the Senate. That was a big story when right. he ran for the Senate and lost and right. under accusations of uh, right. uh, some sexual So he abuse. shouldn't have anything to do with high school, and, and high yet, school athletics, is that what? And yet he's trying to lecture the state. Yep, he's trying to tell. He wants, so he's already put his religion over the law, and now he's trying to encourage school districts to do so. Uh, we have a clip from his press conference. Uh, we have put out a memorandum, and I think you have this. Um, this memorandum is about five pages, and it describes what cites these cases. It's actually one, two, three, four, five. Cites these cases and explains the ruling in Santa Fe and Duval, or Adler. We also have issued a sample policy for schools. Now, we've sent this to every school district, every superintendent, and they know the law, they've got it. But they're being advised by attorneys who do not understand the content of the law. In my opinion, and in the opinion of many of us, it's an attempt to take school prayer away from students at football games in high school. So in this memo that we put out, if you, if you so he was talking about you guys, right? These attorneys, you guys don't know the law. He's talking about us. He's also talking about the school board's attorneys because now, because of our letters, because of the education we've been doing in Alabama, the school board's own attorneys are telling them, no, we're going to get sued if we don't do something about this. This is clear law. Uh, Santa Fe ruled on this loudspeaker prayer issue, and we can't do it anymore. I mean, even in the name of his group, you can tell it's not about constitutional law. You know, they think there's this higher foundation for moral law, that this is basically the Bible dictates what Roy Moore thinks is is right and wrong, not 
uh, you know, and our, under our secular laws, which is what school districts and school boards have to follow. So I think um, schools obviously would be on thin ice to follow what Roy Moore is telling them and ignore the advice of their, their own attorney. Well, and like how we talked about character coach is a, you know, euphemism for someone who's going to preach religion. Same thing, the foundation for moral law is a cover for pushing Christianity over the law. Uh, we took a look at the memo, and uh, interestingly, the memo begins with a Bible verse. Um, it says, I think, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. It's an interesting way to start a legal memo. To, mm -hmm. When you're telling a school district, hey, we're going to tell you the real way that the law works uh, and how you, you, know, you should interact with religion, probably not best to start that off with a Bible verse if you want to come off as a respectable source, as someone, that, an authority for following the law. But isn't that the problem? <clears throat> These people, like Roy Moore and that character coach and others, they really do think there is a higher law than we, the people who made a constitution. I mean, in their heart of hearts, they really think that's where moral authority and law comes from, and students need to have that imposed on them. Yep, they do, and that came across uh, several times during the press conference. Um, but in particular, what, they're, what they want to do in this case is they've come up with a way where they think that they can pretend that they're trying to conflate student religious rights with government speech uh, in the same way that Santa Fe had to deal with that issue. Uh, so they're trying to tell schools, hey, if you pretend that students are going to give whatever message they want, you know, don't tell them to pray. Tell them to give a message before football games. Uh, and then they'll just give prayers, because we all know that's what the point of this is. And then you can pretend that you're not encouraging that prayer. Was that what his policy is recommending? Yeah, we have a clip where uh, one of their attorneys kind of gets into this a little bit. Uh, so in this policy. memo that we put out, we've, uh, we, we've, we've given these school boards some ideas on how to be able to keep prayer, to keep it in the students' hands, and to, uh, to not get sued over it. Um, one suggestion that we have, uh, one suggestion that we're making is if a school board would allow the senior class to elect a student volunteer to give a pregame message before football games. Um, this is something that uh, the school wouldn't control. It would be up to the senior class, and uh, the message would not be subject to, uh, to to censorship or to review beforehand. Um, and if the student wants to take that opportunity to come up and pray, he'd be perfectly at liberty to do that. So what he's describing is very close to what happened in Santa Fe Independent School District. In that case, the school was allowing the students to vote on whether to have a prayer and to vote on who would give that prayer, and the Supreme Court found that that was unconstitutional. So he's encouraging them to do something very similar, uh, to vote on someone to give a message, anything they want, but really they want them to do I mean, prayer. Isn't just, if we get down to it, I mean, isn't this worse? Uh, you know, doesn't this make state church separation worse? Is that you're kind of involving a political process to decide, you know, what prayer or what somebody's going to say for a prayer at the beginning of one of these games? I mean, that seems to me way worse than, um, you know, a, a moment of silence or some of these other things we're talking about. What they're advocating for is worse than what the schools are doing right now. Yep, they are. They want people to to. They want the majority to be able to vote to have religious expression. Right. Essentially, they want the majority religion to be able to impose that on other people. Basically, now shouldn't we point out that this case we're talking about, Santa Fe, that was a Texas school district. It was in the year 2000, and they were doing prayers over the loudspeakers. The people who complained about that, the people who took the case, were not atheists, were they? No. They were, I believe, a, a, a Mormon and a Catholic family, if I'm remembering correct. And I think the prayers tended to be more in the Baptist uh, tradition. So um, it's interesting, you know, and, and this kind of ties into kind of current political events, if you will, with um, uh, Supreme Court uh, nominee uh, Kavanaugh um, wrote a brief in that case. And he was criticizing the plaintiffs, maybe not realizing or, or not caring that they were, in fact, religious people, but didn't want to be told when and how to pray by their school district. So the plaintiffs really like prayer and want to pray, but they don't want the school doing it formally, was the deal. Right, yeah. right. And yeah, they weren't, they weren't non-religious. They weren't, they weren't yeah. opposed to religion or, or prayer in general. Um, so I think that is an interesting point because, you know, we obviously um, get picked on as, you know, only, only non-religious people might not want to pray at the beginning of game. But what if people want to, you know, make decisions on prayer and pray in their own way 
without having the government involved in some way. I think that's uh, obvious that a lot of people do agree with, with that sentiment. So a lot of Christians and Jews, Protestants, Catholics, and others actually support state church separation because it's good for all of us. Right. Yeah. Now, during the press conference, they also kind of make this ridiculous argument that by not having prayer over the loudspeaker, by not infor like pushing Christian prayers onto everyone, that they're actually supporting atheism. Mm -hmm. We have a clip that, of them talking about that. If you, if you completely drive all mention of religion or acknowledgement of God out of the public schools, which is the intent of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, then you really create an establishment of atheism in the public schools, where God is forbidden. And when students do not ever hear about God, they get the implicit message from the school system that God is not important. Indeed, probably he doesn't exist because he's never discussed. That's kind of like um, this mentality that Jesus had, if he ever existed, but in the New Testament, when he said, if you're not with me, you're against me, right? He didn't understand, and a lot of believers don't understand, there is a middle ground called neutrality. And they seem to be thinking, if the school's not promoting Christianity, they're fighting it and they're hurting it. Yep, they're trying to completely flip the script here, where we're saying, Broadcasting Christian prayer over the loudspeaker is endorsing Christianity. It's establishing Christian religion. They're saying, actually, by not letting Christians impose our religion on everyone, you're saying atheism is the true religion, mm -hmm. which, as you point out, is extremely absurd. Uh, it's not the, the say, to not mention God is not the same to go onto the loudspeaker and say there is no God. Yeah. These are not equivalents, um, and that's you know basically exactly all Roy Moore's group pushes. Um, and they've basically alluded to not only being upset about this, but that they actually may try to take a—the Foundation for Moral Law during this press conference in, kind of implies that they would be, possibly sue school districts for not letting Christians have control over the prayer system. Uh, I'm not sure how that case will work out, but you can hear Roy Moore uh, in a clip kind of talks about, uh, talks about this topic. Ever. We are seeing religious liberty taken away. That's why the Foundation for Moral Law— is so involved in these cases. That's why we're so incensed that lawyers out there are advising school boards. Now, somebody's going to get sued on this if they don't wake up. We're not going to sit by and let religious liberty take, be taken from school children when all my life and all the lives of everybody here, they've had prayer before football games. So let me give the politicians some advice out there. If they want to do what's right, they'll follow the law. Not just something we said, but follow the law. Sounds like a threat, doesn't it? Well, and actually, so he, that's the first time that I agree with them from this entire right, press right. conference. School districts should follow the law, and we've explained that law to them many times and, and not follow Roy Moore's group. I don't know that he's, he, he specifically says, listen to me, politicians, and I'm not sure, you know, one of the first, uh, in a long time, one of the first Republican candidates for Senate in Alabama to lose uh, is the right person to be telling politicians what the best way to, to win to, and to But I mean, it almost shows them. how far, um, you know, even in a state like Alabama that has this kind of deep religious history, that things have moved in the right direction. I mean, the fact that schools are starting to change these policies, granted, this is 18 years too late um, from when the Supreme Court decided things, but I mean, they really are moving, um, making correct decisions, and, and maybe that's a product of a more pluralistic society. There are a lot of parents of students today in Alabama schools that have non-religious children. And I think um, that's being recognized even mm -hmm. in a state like Alabama. So I think it's encouraging to see how this is being handled. Obviously, there's some um, you know, uh, pushback that we see from, from people like Ray Moore. And even in any community where this changes, people don't want to stop anything that they've been doing you know, for a long period of time. Nobody agrees, oh, you're right, we've been doing, we've been doing wrong the whole time. Um, you know, they have to kind of be forced to make that change. Well, do you remember, um, you were here then, five or eight years ago uh, in Mississippi, the DeSoto schools, they were doing this very same thing. We sent them a letter of complaint, and the superintendent sent a memo to all the principals, or maybe it was Southern Tennessee. It was one of those areas right, right. by Memphis. And um, he was quoted on the evening news saying, you know, we kind of knew this was wrong, but we figured we'd keep doing it until someone tells us to stop, you know, <laughs> which... Right, right. And what message does that send to students? Right. And luckily in this case, the reason why, you know, Roy Moore's group had to even do this is because 
the school districts are now following the law. And so he's just upset that that's happening. There's a point during the press conference where uh, one of the reporters asked him, what has been the response to your, to your letter? You know, you sent this letter to every superintendent. And he responds that they're ignoring it. Uh, huh. well, you know, they're, they're ignoring I mean, it's not surprising because he's not uh, an authority on this. And I don't think he understands exactly what's going on. They're just trying to push you know, their version of religious liberty, which is Christians should be able to impose their religious views on everyone. I think we've got one final clip to sum this up uh, from, from the press conference of Roy Moore. Liberty comes from God, and you can't restrict its acknowledgement by people in public square. And that's the ruling of the Supreme Court. I don't, he doesn't cite a case there. I don't know yeah. why he didn't cite a case for when the Supreme Court ruled that. Liberty comes from God. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so he also wrote us a letter, didn't he? Do we have that here or do? Uh, well, so we should just backtrack just a little. After this press conference took place, you and Annie Laurie wrote him a letter. Yeah. Um, you know, letting him know that, that what he's telling school districts is not true. They can't come up with a workaround to the Constitution, a way to force prayer onto everyone uh, constitutionally, because that is unconstitutional. Uh, we then did receive a response from him. Now, in your letter, you allude to him being treasonous because he's going against our secular constitution. Uh, in his response, he says, if this be treason, as Patrick Henry said, make the most of it. So he's not shying away from the fact that he doesn't really agree with what our founding fathers and what our constitution says about the country. He really does want Christ that us to be a Christian nation and for Christianity to be supreme over all other Because it was uh, treasonous in the Revolutionary War to go against uh, Britain, right? That was yep, an act of treason. That's, that's he thinks he's the patriotic hero here, doesn't he? Yep, he believes he's fighting back against this secular country, you know, that is as instilled in our Constitution. Uh, that's what he believes. Um, he's wrong. We are a secular nation. And that's for the better. I mean, that's a good, a good thing, not a, not a bad thing. Yeah. So you guys have been busy with um, school complaints, and, and is it mostly, it's the fall then, basically, where you get all these big sports things, huh? Right. Well, you know, the, usually the end of August, beginning of September, there are, we hear from parents, and we hear from students sometimes, and from teachers, about violations in public schools. That probably makes up at about more than half of the issues that we're working on. But again, it seems to be typical uh, uh, football prayer in part because it's such a big gathering of people. In some communities, that's their Friday night. You know, they go to the football game. And if so if, if your community is gathered around a football game, um, your community shouldn't be gathered around a Christian prayer, you know, to be a part of that game. So I think we hear from people that recognize their, their schools are doing things that they shouldn't be. Um, and, and they just want them to, you know, stop and be really welcoming to, you know, people who aren't fitting within the religion of the community. I think it's important to note, contrary to what they say in that press conference, that, you know, we're not all about removing all prayer from public life, you know, everything like that in these cases. It's, it's about school-sponsored prayer, prayer over the loudspeaker, coaches leading prayer, the school in some way encouraging uh, or promoting or getting students to pray, students who of their own choice choose to pray uh, before the game, after, during, whenever they want is fine. You know, we're not trying to say that the, these people don't exist. We're just saying schools cannot force prayer onto everyone. You know, that, that's the issue here is the school sponsoring prayer. So if somebody at the ball game is wearing an I Love Jesus t-shirt, we're not going to run up in the stands and say, take that shirt off. You're violating the Constitution. Yep. And that's <laughs> been happening in a lot of these communities where the loudspeaker prayer stops. There's a bit of a backlash where suddenly everyone's making t-shirts or they're saying the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, hmm. the Lord's Prayer themselves, you know, uh, before the game uh, without the school's endorsement, without the loudspeaker. And that that's something that they can do. You know, we're not trying to take away people's religious rights. We're trying to take away uh, schools endorsing religion and uh, take and stopping non-believers from having rights. You know, we're trying to protect the rights of everyone in these cases. So do we have more to see, or should we go to nope, questions? I think that's here? it uh, for clips. Um, so are we'll there questions, Lauren? Questions. Um, <laughs> Hopefully we've got some. Um, okay, we do have a question. Brian Duncan, are chaplains in the workplace legal? Well, I, I can take my first. Um, you know, that really depends on, the, on how they're operating. So, for instance, in the United States military, um, when people are overseas, there may well be a need or there's an argument to accommodate a soldier's religion, that they're not, they can't just go to the religious community. They, they need 
um, to, to have religious services or counseling. Um, there's at least an argument for um, chaplains in uh, when somebody is removed from, uh, you know, from their home. But he's and asking it, about the workplace. Right. Here, and so in so. the workplace, assuming that this is a secular employer in the United States, no. I mean, chaplains, um, we think chaplains are a problem in the workplace. Um, we've seen it in as, uh, you know, potentially a government employers we're talking about. Um, private employers, uh, there may not be a problem with them having a chaplain, assuming that they're not discriminating against employees on the basis of religion. So uh, as a government employer, where we see this is sometimes you'll see it with police departments. Um, we see it in college uh, athletics football programs, which it's a problem and unconstitutional. And then sometimes it's as bizarre. I think the, the one of the more bizarre ones that I saw was in New York City, um, they have uh, their sanitation department has chaplains. More than one. The people paid. who pick up the trash? Well, mean? I think in New York they do more than just that. But, yeah, their sanitation department has chaplains. And so what's the need? You know, what? How? why should the government be paying a chaplain and providing a chaplain for, um, hmm. you know, somebody who could easily, uh, after work or on the weekend, attend religious services? There's no need for it. It's, it's gratuitous. And... New York City taxpayers shouldn't be paying for this religious position. You know, that's both in the New York Constitution yeah. and in the U.S. Constitution. So, so it's hard to know, depending on what context um, this employer is, but it's a pro I think it is a problem um, for government employers to do that, unless there's some overarching difficulty in accommodating, which may well be somebody in a prison or somebody, you know, overseas in the military. So would would we say that a passive accommodation could be constitutional as long as they're not pushing the religion? Right. There would need be some need to accommodate religion, which again would typically be some barrier. If you're incarcerated, you have that barrier. You can't yeah. just go to, to ha get religious worship. And if, if you're serving in a foreign country or you're, or, uh, you know, in the Navy, you may need to, in order to engage in, in religious worship, you may need somebody to help help with that. Yeah. But generally, no. I mean, generally, you don't need that when you're just living at home and could could go to service at any time so on your own. The military crosses the line, don't we think? That that huge chapel at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Have you seen that? That huge, tall aluminum thing. Colorado Springs is not some foreign wilderness right, where right. people. You know, the Air Force cadets, they don't, they're, they're, they're deprived of their right to worship. And yet here's this huge chapel to, quote, unquote, accommodate religion. Right. And actually, the, the military academies have had a long history of promoting religion. In fact, they got the, some of them had been sued. Um, and some of these cases may even go back to the 1980s, where they were sued for forcing cadets to go to religious worship services on, on Sunday. Um, they got to pick if it, I mean, there's only three options, really. Um, but they were sued, and the and the military lost those cases. So basically, I think that's just a, a product of there's a long um, kind of entanglement between religion and the military in the United States. And so, uh, any accommodation which may need to be, um, which maybe is permissible, has probably gone a lot further past that than what would what would be you know the minimum to be required. There's actually four options at the the Air Force Academy. I did a wedding there actually. A, a secular wedding in the Protestant chapel. The Protestant chapel's on top. Underneath is a smaller Catholic. Sorry, Patrick. I mean, <laughs> we were raised Catholic. But it was like a smaller Catholic chapel. Down at the uh, ground level is this little tiny uh, uh, Jewish uh, synagogue, I guess. Little, what looks like maybe 20 people would fit in there. But they took me down the hallway in the basement, and in the back there's like this closet where the secular humanists can meet and play cards. <laughs> so there's four <laughs> options there. <laughs> oh, wow. um, did you want to say something, or shall we go to another? Well, no, I, mean, I would just sort of reiterate your point that there, there is or has been in the past some legitimate use for chaplains, but I think most of them that we see now are not being used for the legitimate purpose of providing you know, an accommodation to religion where it's needed, but they're just using it as an excuse to bring in someone to promote and to proselytize to people. Yeah. The way they're bringing chaplains into school football teams, they do the same thing in a police department. You know, some local pastor volunteers to come in and preach to police. And of course, they're happy that you mentioned specifically um, ones employed by the city or that are paid, but there's also lots of volunteer chaplains who are like, oh, can I hang around the police and just promote religion to them? Uh, and of course, they're happy to do that because that's what they believe that they're supposed to be doing as, you know, Christian pastors, just promoting and trying to proselytize and get everyone to, to be Christians. So here's a question from Ireland. Somebody's watching us from <laughs> over the pond 
And uh, actually, Ireland is making great strides right now in, uh, in social issues and gay marriage and uh, abortion rights. We're, we're kind of jealous of you Irish now. Uh, you're, you're passing us here. But uh, here's somebody named Austin O'Keefe from Ireland. He asks, how can Americans think that the God that ignores famines, disasters, and wars would listen and interfere in a sports game? especially when the opposition team is mainly Christian also. <laughs> so uh, this was actually brought up. Uh, Hemet Mehta, the friendly atheist, wrote a story on one of the cases where we stopped prayer at a game. The team uh, did the Lord's Prayer and everyone wore shirts and they kind of, the community prayed, you know, before the game and the team lost like 3 to 48 or something mm -hmm. like that or whatever. So clearly uh, the, it, the prayer is not, you know, helping them win. You know, we're seeing even in places where they're praying, people are being hurt. Football is a dangerous game. It doesn't seem to be having any effect on protecting players. So I'm not sure what they think prayer is doing or what, what besides just using it as an opportunity to push their religion on everyone, I'm not sure what they think the point of praying at football games is. And I think that's a good point that's brought well, up. Well, maybe if person. they hadn't prayed, a lot more players would have got hurt than actually did. So it's or a they, miracle. Or they would have lost by more points. You yeah. Know, God's mysterious, you know, works in mysterious ways. So one less touchdown as opposed to, uh, you know, making them win the game. I, I don't know. But there is that sort of natural human impulse to want help, especially when you're young children. You know, your teenage children are out there in harm's way. You want to, you know, if you're a believer, you want some kind of help. Help. You, prayer is sort of a natural thing that a lot of believers do. I think this is tapping in a little <laughs> bit, though, to particularly with some of the issues that we're talking about. The prayers can become absurd because I've I've watched... Um, some video clips of um, college football chaplains do prayers, and they're doing these right before, they're doing these to help pump up the team before they go out on the field. And so I think there is a little bit of um, absurdity to it that, you know, you're basically pumping these people up to go hit the other team and to go score more touchdowns. And the idea is, if, if you really believe in the power of prayer, wouldn't, and, and there is a God responding to any of these prayers, wouldn't there be better things that this God would be, like, why would the God be listening to your prayer about, you know, um, scoring two more touchdowns than the other team. So I, th I think that's certainly, you know, what that's tapping into. So we're not just playing for our little Dawson, Georgia school district. We're playing for God. I mean, this is a bigger thing. I'm really going to work hard now. Yep, and it's a win-win <laughs> situation, I guess, because if they win the game, God made them win the game. If they lost, maybe God's teaching them something. I don't know. You know yeah, they come we're up learning with humility. Yeah. So we're almost out of time here. We have a few more questions. Lindsay Leanne. Have you ever had a case where there was a non-Christian prayer before a football game, like Islamic or Jewish prayer? Never, um, never have had that in sporting, the sporting context. In one of the Supreme Court cases, um, uh, Lee versus Weissman, the prayer did involve a rabbi, uh, but it was a non-denominational prayer in that case. That was also unconstitutional, but generally, I can confidently say we're only seeing this with, with Christian prayers in the sporting context. Well, with Levy Weissman, um, and we met their family. They spoke at our convention back in the 90s. The uh, rabbi was sort of a last-minute sop. They, oh, right. the Jewish students are complaining, so let's give them a rabbi once in a while. And the complainants in that case was a Jewish family, the Weissman family. Even having a rabbi didn't appease them. They didn't want the school taking over their religious function when they wanted to pray for themselves. so. Uh. And to bring it back to what we were talking about a little earlier, during that press conference, one of the reporters asked Roy Moore, point blank, what do you think about a Muslim student giving a prayer over the loudspeaker? And he said he wouldn't support it. He would not. Uh, he would not support uh, a Muslim prayer, um, would just to show even further that what he wants is Christian prayer and, and that that's the, what all these people want when they try to put prayer over the loudspeaker. Well, you can imagine what would happen in some southern texas high school game if some muslim gets up and starts chanting to allah in arabic what would happen there in that community yeah i don't think they'd be as uh, <laughs> uh -huh. pushing for loudspeaker prayer as much as they are uh, uh -huh. if that happened okay joey i don't know how to say your name joey F fugelwitz i guess or fugelwitz um sorry about that uh <laughs> what kind of reaction do you get from those schools after you stop the prayers is there a backlash from the 
for the complainants? Do the plaintiffs get any in trouble? Uh, no. So we uh, don't reveal who our complainants are in these cases. You know, that's part of um, our bylaws. We don't, you know, we just say a, a concerned local complainant uh, brought it up to us. So in most of the cases, they don't know. We'll see comments. I mean, they refer, they'll often refer and say, oh, we're so upset with this person who's, you know, trying to, who doesn't want the prayer, but they don't know who that person is. And so usually um, we don't have to worry about that because they, they don't find out who our complainants are. But communities do have a big backlash. You know, like I alluded to earlier, you'll get T-shirt campaigns where everyone's got to wear a T-shirt with the Lord's Prayer, them trying to shout out prayers at the games, things like that. Um, so the community does back does have a lot of backlash. But usually the school districts are pretty good. They, they see the law we cite, they change their policies, and they do the right thing. And then the community just gets upset about it, usually. Should the district take us seriously if we don't reveal the actual complainant? I mean, do they have to take seriously a complaint from some outside group without naming names? Well, you know, I mean, as you know, when we've taken um, some of the cases involving schools, we often have get a protective order to make sure that our um, you know, students within the school system aren't going to be attacked. So we won't use their names even when we pursue it. And so um, we often will point out to the school system uh, the benefit that they're receiving by not knowing who this is because they shouldn't want, unfortunately, we've seen teachers bully students you know, when it's known that they've been opposing some of these policies or um, just systemically you know, getting bad treatment by other classmates and bullying. So. Uh, I really think it serves the school district's interest to um, not have to deal with a potential, you know, uh, target, a student who opposes some of these practices. And it's, it's in our uh, complainant's interest to not be identified because certainly yeah. um, they well, may well be bullied by other students. Well, what if they, their family runs a local business in town and it comes out, you're the people who complained about prayer? That could be really bad for the family. It could, but the other thing that's important to remember is we, you know, we know the statistics about non-believers in communities, and in these, you know, even in these small towns, there's not just one, you know, person who's upset about this. Uh, as it showed in that news clip earlier, where the anchor said several members of the community reached out to him anonymously to say that they wanted this to stop. Uh, we know that that's the case. So we only may have one complainant who's actually come to us, but we know that there's more people in these communities who want it to stop that just, they can't speak out. You know, as I explained, there's this community backlash and they don't want anything bad to happen to them. And it's hard. How do you stand up against this religious fervor uh, in these small communities? It's dangerous. So mm -hmm. they shouldn't. And that's why we exist. So they can come through us and we can take the heat and get these constitutional violations fixed without anyone getting hurt or having to face that kind of personal scrutiny. Okay, last question. Are you guys done here? Yeah. With that? Uh, Jeff St. Clair is asking, is this mostly a Southern Bible Belt issue? I would say no. Um, I mean, we're, it's they've been slower to uh, fix some of the problems, but we do have this same problem in school districts uh, across the U.S. will we'll do the same, the same things that we're seeing in, in Georgia and Alabama. Yeah, but it seems a little more intense in the South because of how strong football and religion and belief are. But, um, but it does happen all over the country. So, yeah, it, it may be a little more intense sometimes, but it, it is a nationwide issue and not just specific to the South. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Patrick Elliott and Chris Lyon, uh, constitutional attorneys here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, uh, working hard to keep state and church separate. And before we end the show, let's just remind all of you, you, you already know about the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, the vote hasn't happened yet, but if you want to, well, you should weigh in. Um, I used to be a preacher. I could threaten eternal consequences, but now there are actual material consequences to having a good... Uh, Supreme Court. So you can contact your senator, call that number that's on the screen, 202-224-3121, and weigh in with your opinion about this uh, anti-state church separation nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's our show for today. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll be back again next week. And don't forget, our convention in San Francisco is coming up. It's November 2nd through 4th. And uh, are, are either... Yeah, I can announce some of our speakers include eminent writer Salman Rushdie, uh, former director of Planned Parenthood Cecile Richards, Mythbusters host Adam Savage, actor John DeLancey of Star Trek fame, ex-Muslims of North America co-founder Sarah Hader, award-winning stand-up comedian 
uh, Liam Lord, and irreverent actress and SNL alum Julia Sweeney. Also appearing at the convention will be Ensof Hader, the activist wife of a Saudi freethinker whose persecution and imprisonment have caused global outrage. You can register online today at fff.org slash outreach slash convention. And we'll see you there in San Francisco. If you want to receive FFRF text alerts on your smartphone, you can text FFRF to, and what is that number, 52886? And data rates might apply. Again, that's text FFRF to 52886. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist.